Good afternoon, or depending where you are in the world, a good morning or good evening. My name is Dylan William, and I'm presenting this webinar, which is entitled Why Formative Assessment Should Be a Priority for Every District, School and Teacher. The argument I want to make is very simple. I want to suggest that we now we know what determines how quickly students learn, we need to focus our efforts to really improve student achievement. It turns out that teacher quality is the key ingredient here. But teacher quality is actually quite mysterious. It's not what people think it is. I want to spend some time talking about how we can improve teacher quality. And in particular, what kinds of changes in teacher quality will have the biggest impact on student achievement. And then to spend a little time thinking about how we help teachers improve. Now, it's important to realise that we know quite a lot about what influences student progress. So the biggest factor is the students' interests, motivations, and so on. We know that school organisation can have an impact. But it turns out that school organisation is relatively less important. Whether it's a charter school or a private school seems to have relatively little impact. It's instructional quality that matters. And obviously that depends on the quality of the curriculum, the time teachers have to plan teaching, one of the most remarkable things about teachers in the US is that they're in front of students between 1,000 and 1,100 hours per year, whereas in many other countries, teachers are only teaching five or 600 hours per year, and they have time during every single day either to plan good instruction or to meet with colleagues. The size of classes is obviously another trade-off. We tended to go for smaller classes rather than instructional um, available time for teachers to plan good teaching. And the resources are, that are available obviously will have an impact, the quality of the buildings, but it turns out that the biggest factor is the skill of the teacher. We know that some teachers are more productive than others. If students are in their classroom, then they learn more. And due to some experiments done by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded Measures of Effective Teaching Project, we actually know that if we move those teachers to different schools where they teach different kinds of students, they are still more effective. So there's something that the individual teacher carries around with them that seems to make a huge impact to how much children learn. So obviously teaching quality is, the, is what matters, but the biggest component of teaching quality is actually teacher quality. The next slide shows um, a summary of the research on teacher quality, and it's a bit technical, but a number of studies have been conducted exploring the very simple question, if you're in some teachers' classrooms, do you make more progress than if you're in other teachers' classrooms? And so the studies that are listed there have been done all over the US, and they looked at whether the correlation between the teacher quality and the student progress is high or low. And if it was zero, then which teacher you had would make no difference at all to how much you learn. The higher the number, the bigger the influence the teacher has on the student's progress. And you can see that there's some variation in the data, but the broad finding is that there's a significant correlation between how good the teacher is and how much progress students make. So let's put that into concrete terms. What the data in that chart mean is that if we take 50 teachers, all teaching the same thing, like fourth grade math, if you are taught by the best teacher in that group of 50 teachers, you will learn in six months. What students taught by the average teacher will take a year to learn. And if you are taught by the least effective teacher in that group of 50 teachers, that same learning will take you two years. What we now realize is that the most effective teachers are four times as effective as the least effective. And that's actually quite surprising to many people, although it's not unprecedented in the world of work. Good computer programmers are at least 10 times as productive as the weakest ones. So this is not unprecedented, but I think it's quite a surprise to realize that in some teachers' classrooms, students make far more progress than in other teachers' classrooms. More importantly, in the classrooms of the most effective teachers, Students from disadvantaged backgrounds learn at the same rate as those from advantaged backgrounds. And that is quite surprising to a lot of people. We know that social disadvantage has a huge impact on student progress. But for some reason, which we don't entirely understand, if you are in 
the classroom of one of the best teachers, doesn't matter what background you come from, you'll make the same amount of progress. So that's why politicians have recently focused on teacher quality. How do we improve teacher quality? The trouble is, it takes some pinning down. So recall that in the previous slide I pointed out that if you're taught by the best teacher in a group of 50, you make 12 months more progress than if you're taught by an average teacher. You make two years progress as opposed to one year's progress. So the question is, how much of that is subject knowledge? Because people talk about this quite a lot in the United States. People say that teachers don't know their subject well enough to teach it effectively. So if you're taught math in fourth grade by a teacher who has outstanding subject knowledge, say in the top 5% of all teachers, how many more months progress would you make compared with the average teacher? So if you believe that subject knowledge is the whole of teacher quality, then you'd say the answer is 12. Because you'd say that basically that 12-month advantage is entirely due to content knowledge. If you think that it's completely irrelevant, that content knowledge doesn't matter at all, you'd say zero. So I want you to stop and think for a minute. Just think to yourself, what proportion of teacher quality is content knowledge? In other words, on a scale of 0 to 12, how much more progress will you make if you are taught by a teacher with outstanding subject knowledge? Now, when I ask this in groups of teachers, the answers range from typically 1 or 2 to about 10. And the surprising thing is the answer is actually 1. You will learn slightly more if you're taught by a more knowledgeable teacher but not very much more. And this is one of the really interesting things about teacher quality. It doesn't seem to be primarily about subject knowledge. Now the effect is slightly larger in secondary schools than it is in elementary schools, but the fact is that teacher subject knowledge doesn't seem to be a very big part of what it is that makes some teachers more effective than others. And that's why I call this the dark matter of teacher quality. We know that teacher quality matters, we know that teachers make a difference, but we don't know what makes the difference in teachers, which makes policy prescriptions rather complex. So how do we improve teacher quality? Well, across the US a number of things have been tried. Some of them have, have been about replacing existing teachers with better ones. So the idea is that we should maybe raise the bar for entry into the profession. Okay, let's get smarter people teaching. And that's attractive because many of the countries that get good scores on these international comparisons, like Singapore, like Finland, do have very selective entry into teacher education. It's common to find 10, even 20 applicants for every place on an elementary teacher preparation program in Singapore and Finland. And people think, well, that must be why they're so successful. They forget to look at Ireland, where entry into teacher preparation programs is at least as selective as Finland and the results are even worse than the US. So just getting smart people into teaching doesn't seem to make a difference and more importantly it doesn't seem that people with higher academic credentials make better teachers. So maybe we should just raise the bar for transfers and this is something that Eric Hanishek has suggested that we should actually every time uh, somebody transfers we should hire not at the 50th percentile the average but at say the 58th percentile and that might be helpful if we knew how to identify good teachers in an interview or in a transfer discussion uh, the fact is we don't could we speed this process up by removing the less effective teachers well this is obviously very very attractive uh, everybody thinks they know a bad teacher when they see it and at the extremes that probably is the case so i think it's highly likely that we can reliably identify really, really effective and really, really ineffective teachers. So we can be really sure, 95% sure, that somebody who looks really, really good is not in fact very, very bad. And we can be 95% sure that somebody who looks very, very bad is not in fact a very, very good teacher. But here's the problem. Right now, our ability to identify effective practice is so limited that we can't even be sure that a teacher who looks very bad is not in fact above average and a teacher who looks very good is not in fact below average. Now this is something that most people find very hard to believe. Everybody knows what a good teaching looks like. But let's think 
for a minute about what we mean by good teaching. Because obviously a good teacher is a teacher whose students make more progress. They learn more. But what is learning? Well, as Paul Kirshner and his colleagues have pointed out, learning is a change in long-term memory. If nothing has been changed in long-term memory, then nothing has been learned. So what you're trying to do when you look at teaching is you're trying to identify how much of what's going on in this classroom right now will these students remember in six weeks' time? And that's why it's very, very hard to identify good teaching. Heather Hill at Harvard has estimated that if you just wanted to get a teacher evaluation rating from an observation that's as accurate as the SAT, you'd need to have that teacher observed teaching five different classes and have each lesson observed by six independent observers. You need 30 independent evaluations of a teacher just to get a consistent rating of how good that teacher is. And the problem is even more severe when you look at value-added measures of, of teacher quality. So people have given up on observation. OK, if we can't observe good teachers, let's just test the students at the beginning of the year, test the students at the end of the year, and see which teachers have students making most progress. It's a very attractive idea but it's impossible to do accurately. So methodologically, it's complex because the data are very noisy, but there's a more fundamental problem. Where I live in Florida, we teach students reading and writing in third grade and fourth grade, but we only test reading in third grade. In fourth grade, we test reading and writing. So if you're a third grade teacher and you're worried about looking good, you wouldn't actually spend any time teaching writing because your students aren't gonna be assessed on writing. But if you're a fourth grade teacher, you hope that the teacher who had your students in third grade has spent a lot of time on writing, because otherwise you're starting from scratch, and it's going to be very hard for you to actually make good progress with your students. So it turns out that it's actually impossible to take the progress a student makes over a number of years and apportion that to different teachers. Teaching is a marathon, not a sprint. And good teachers lay down foundations for future learning that are not reflected in students' scores at the end of the year, but they are reflected in those students' scores years in the future. Good teachers benefit students for at least three years after they stop teaching them. In other words, we can actually see the benefit of good teachers in teachers teaching the same students years later. So that's counterintuitive, but I think the evidence is now pretty solid. We cannot consistently, reliably identify effective teaching, which is why I actually think that we should give up trying to um, remove bad teachers or pay bonuses to teachers who are more effective. We don't know how to do it. We can't do it. I think we have to help existing teachers improve. The idea is we actually say to every single teacher, you need to get better, not because you're not good enough, but because you can be even better what my colleague Marnie Thompson has called the love the one you're with strategy. Now, the important point is it can be done. We do know that teachers can improve, but we have to make sure we focus the teacher's improvement on the things that make the biggest difference to students. We have to focus rigorously on the things that matter. And it turns out that they're very hard to do. So most teacher professional development over the last 30 years in the United States has focused on improving teachers' knowledge, giving them new information. And it turns out that that's not particularly helpful because that's not the thing that makes the biggest difference. What we have to realize is the most effective teacher professional development changes what teachers do in classrooms, not what they know. And that's why effective professional development is largely a process of habit change, not of knowledge acquisition. And that's where we've got it wrong. Over the last 30 years, we focused on teachers' professional development as being learning new stuff, not changing what they do in classrooms. Now, at this point, many people argue that that would be great if teachers could improve, but there's no evidence they can. Uh, people suggest that teachers can't improve. Economists routinely regard teacher quality as made up of teacher talent and teacher effort. And because they don't think that teacher talent can be affected very much, they instead believe that the best way to improve education is to improve teacher effort, for example, through incentive pay, uh, 
differentiated compensation, paying the better teachers more. But the evidence is that in fact teachers can change a lot. And I want to spend some time now going to the research on expertise because I think this gives us some very interesting insights into how teachers might be supported in improving. So this is based on the work of um, Anders Ericsson and his colleagues. And he has suggested, by looking at expertise in a whole range of fields, like table tennis, like chess, like scuba diving, like um, x-ray diagnosis, that expertise is specific and limited. Grand master chess players are no better than average at playing checkers. Expertise is only weakly related to general ability. So IQ, having a high IQ makes you a better chess player for the first year or two. But beyond that, there's very little relationship. And what really matters much more is how many games you've played against real opponents or how many games you've studied. Interestingly, how many games you've played against a computer doesn't seem to matter very much. But the important point is, after a few years, natural talent doesn't seem to matter anything like as much as the amount of practice. One of the things that people have investigated to quite a great degree is whether we can speed up the process of knowledge acquisition. And in certain limited areas, it can be speeded up. Training can speed up the development of, of expertise. But in most of the areas, where it's been studied, it's been shown that expertise can't be reduced to the kind of knowledge that you can tell somebody else. Expertise is much more like riding a bicycle than it is like solving quadratic equations. The idea of, of actually telling people what they should be doing doesn't seem to work very well in most of the areas of expertise that have been studied. People just have to practice it a lot. And in particular, it involves making things that are, to begin with, quite difficult, becoming automatic. And we see this all the time. When children are learning how to write the letters of the alphabet, it's a very mechanical, laborious process. And after a while, it becomes automated. And we see that in a whole range of things, including x-ray diagnosis, including chess. It's about making those basic procedures automatic. And finally, um, the last two are about perceiving meaningful patterns and organizing your knowledge differently. So this is the work of um, Michelin Chi, who's shown, for example, that often experts don't have more knowledge, they just have differently organized knowledge. So if you show a range of physics problems, for example, to people and ask them to classify them or to group them into some sort of sensible grouping, novices tend to group them on their surface features, the cover story. Is it a story about an inclined plane or, or something like that? Whereas, novice, uh, whereas experts tend to classify problems according to how you might solve them. Would you resolve horizontally? Would you resolve vertically? Would you take moments? And so they actually have different connections between their existing bits of knowledge. And you may have heard the figure of 10,000 hours associated with research on expertise. That doesn't actually have a lot of credibility. It's based on one study by Andres Ericsson and his colleagues of 20 violin students who are being asked to recall how much practice they'd done years earlier. So there's nothing specially significant about 10,000 hours, but there does seem to be something special about 10 years of practice. So Anders Ericsson and his colleagues suggest that the highest level of performance is the result of at least 10 years of maximally focused efforts to improve performance through a, and what they call an optimal distribution of deliberate practice. And the point they make about deliberate practice is it's not fun. The old joke is that, you know, if you're enjoying your violin practice, you're not doing it right. Deliberate practice is not motivating or enjoyable. It's instrumental in achieving further increases in performance. So that's the research on expertise. Does it apply to teaching? Well, this is drawn on the work of David Berliner. And he's shown that, as far as we can tell, expertise in teaching seems to have all the hallmarks of expertise in other domains. So the list on the previous slide, only being weakly rated to general ability, is not reducible to propositional knowledge, involves automation of basic routines, 
That seems to apply just as much to teaching as it does to other areas of expertise like chess. More importantly, if this research did not apply to teaching, it would have to be the case that all the other domains that have been studied were in some sense similar and different from teaching. And that seems frankly implausible. So, as far as we can tell, it seems plausible to conclude that what is true for other areas of expertise is also true for teaching. In other words, elite performance is the result of at least 10 years of maximal attempts to improve performance through an optimal distribution of distributed practice. In other words, pushing yourself to get better and better and better for at least 10 years. Does this happen in teaching? The evidence will suggest not. The evidence that we have suggests that teachers improve quite rapidly in their first two or three years, and then actually almost all teachers slow down, and many teachers actually stop improving. So it suggests that we need to focus more on helping teachers improve once they're beyond those initial stages. And of course, what's happening right now in the United States is a lot of effort is going into teacher evaluation with a view to improving teacher quality. My argument is that our current efforts at teacher evaluation will have zero impact on how good teachers are, because simply the processes that we're using are not designed to do that very effectively. I want to draw a distinction here between evaluation frameworks and improvement frameworks. So there are many evaluation frameworks that are being used across the US. Um, one is the framework by Charlotte Danielson called the Framework for Teaching, and it's a very impressive achievement. Until Charlotte Danielson's work, we had no way of consistently relating what teachers did to student progress. And now in the Framework for Teaching, we have consistent relationships. We can actually observe things that certain teachers do that other teachers don't, that are consistently associated with student achievement. So it turns out, for example, from some studies in Chicago, if you're taught by a teacher who is rated as distinguished on the Danielson framework, you will make 30% more progress each year than if you're taught by a teacher rated as unsatisfactory. And that's a huge achievement, to actually have a way of observing teaching to say, yes, these teachers will, on average, get more achievement than these other teachers. So I don't want to belittle the achievements of the framework for teaching, but I do want to sound a caution, because, as we discussed a few slides ago, the best teachers are 400% more effective than the least effective. So, good as it is, the Danielson framework captures only a small proportion of the variation in teacher quality. And the same thing is true for other frameworks like those produced by Morzano and others. They are the best we have, and they are quite effective at distinguishing, on average, between more effective and less effective teachers. But the danger is that their comprehensiveness is their biggest weaknesses. By definition, evaluation frameworks have to be comprehensive. They have to include all the things that teachers do. They include all aspects of teachers' work. And there, therefore, they incentivize teachers to get better at the things that are easier to get better at. If you're being evaluated on a framework that says, here's the things you need to get better at, then you'll prioritize the ones where it's easiest to show improvement. Those might actually make you look a lot better. They may not be the things that necessarily help your students. And we have seen in many districts, we have actually seen teachers being incentivized to improve performance on aspects of practice that are of no benefit to their students, but are easy to improve. What I'm suggesting is that to be effective, and many districts and states now are mandating evaluation frameworks, but to be effective, evaluation frameworks have to be focused. Improvement frameworks have to be selective and they have to focus rigorously and relentlessly on the aspects of practice that have the greatest payoff for students. In other words, to maximize improvement, evaluation frameworks have to be used selectively. And that, I think, is not happening in most of the places where evaluation frameworks are being used in the US. So how can we actually focus these improvement frameworks most effectively? Well, you might look to educational research. And what I want to focus on is an important limitation of educational research. 
Many years ago, David Hume suggested you couldn't deduce an ought from an is. And in particular, you can't... Educational research will never tell you what might be, only what was. So it turns out, for example, that ability grouping doesn't seem to benefit students very much. But of course, in most schools, when students are grouped by ability, the best students are allocated to the teacher who's the most effective. So that might be true for the research that's been done. It doesn't tell us what might happen if the best teachers were allocated to teach the students who found the subject most difficult. We know that homework, according to the research, is not particularly effective, but then most of the homework the teachers set is of poor quality. So what the research really shows is that poor quality homework does no good at all. There's a big debate about whether class size reduction is effective. And the problem is that it's very expensive. But more importantly, it's rarely a company of professional development. So if you just reduce a class a size of a class from, say, 30 down to 20, and don't support teachers in teaching differently, then you won't get much of a benefit. A teacher standing in front of a class of 20 is no more effective than a teacher standing in front of a class of 30, or indeed a class of 300. But if class size reduction is accompanied by programs of professional development that allow teachers to take advantage of the smaller classes, then it might be a very different picture. Finally, a study of teachers' aides in the United Kingdom showed that teachers' aides were actually reducing student achievement. They were just not, not, not just having no impact, they were actually making things worse. But of course, in many schools, these teacher, teachers' aides were being assigned to help students with profound and special learning difficulties for which they were ill-prepared. So it wasn't that the teacher's aides were ineffective, it was the way they were deployed in these particular studies that were ineffective. The important conclusion from all this is that any educational leader has to be a critical consumer of educational research. We have to actually look at the research and say, well, would this apply to my school? Does this apply to my students? Is it likely to be something that is going to be relevant to our experiences? And that's, there's just no getting around that. Leaders have to be critical consumers of research. You can't have anybody telling you what the research says and follow it blindly. That's why I think we have to do what Robert Slavin and others have called best evidence synthesis. If we had more time, I could go into the difficulties of meta-analysis as a technique in education. But what I'm suggesting is that any kind of mechanical approach to synthesizing research is unlikely to be useful. We have to synthesize the evidence in the best way we can, and that requires subjective judgment. It's not a science, it's much more of an art, but that doesn't make it any weaker. Indeed, in my view, it makes it stronger. So now I want to focus on what the research actually says around formative assessment, because the claim I'm going to make is that there's nothing that we know of right now that's going to have a bigger impact on student achievement. And the bottom-up argument is based on this idea of best evidence synthesis. So a number of people have reviewed the research on feedback and other aspects of formative assessment. And these 18 studies that are listed here, between them, synthesize the results of over 5,000 research reports. So each of these studies is a review of research, and they all find consistent, substantial effects. The problem, of course, is that formative assessment itself isn't an agreed term. There are different definitions of it. So people use it in different ways. And what I suggest as a way of clarifying the, the different usages that people are making is to talk about long cycle, medium cycle, and short cycle formative assessment. So the long cycle is characterized by a span of typically across a teaching unit or a term, a time interval of typically four weeks to one year. And these kinds of approaches can improve curriculum alignment, making sure that what you're teaching is well aligned to the tests. And more importantly, can give you good information about whether the students are making the progress that they need to be making. The medium cycles, formative assessments occur within teaching units where we typically share the learning intentions with the students to make sure that they understand what they're meant to be doing and the outcome can be much more effective student-involved assessment. 
And in the US so far, this is where the emphasis typically has been in terms of long cycle, medium cycle formative assessment. And I understand why. It's because it's easy to implement because it doesn't involve changing what teachers do in terms of their regular routines. However, the research is actually quite clear. The biggest impact comes when teachers do formative assessment minute by minute and day by day, not week by week and month by month. Within and between lessons, typically, very short cycle formative assessment because then you get improvement in student engagement and teaching is more responsive to student needs. Now different people define formative assessment in different ways. The framework that we found most helpful in our work um, is to think about it as three processes, where the learner is going, where the learner is right now and how to get there, and thinking about the role of the teacher the peer and the learner, you get five strategies, nine cells, which will be grouped into five strategies. So the first one is clarifying, sharing, and understanding learning intentions, making sure you know where you're going. The second one is eliciting evidence, how far are we making progress along the direction we want to go, giving students feedback about how to move their learning forward, activating students as learning resources for one another, and finally, and most centrally, activating students as owners of their own learning. So the key idea here is, is that ultimately the goal is always to help students become self-regulating learners because as soon as students are able to monitor their own learning, then they can continue to advance their learning when the teacher isn't around. So these five strategies come together as a way of ensuring that we use evidence of what happens in classrooms to adjust what we're doing to better meet student learning needs. That's a very, that's the big idea. We're constantly using evidence to adjust what happens to better meet learning needs. Now these five strategies can be implemented in a number of ways. Um, I just want to give you some examples of what we call techniques to distinguish between strategies and techniques. So the, the strategies are the old the things that are always good to do, the techniques, are the specific ways you do that. So for example, in the United States now, it's very common to give students rubrics to share the learning intentions. Turns out that's not particularly effective because rubrics don't mean to novices what they mean to experts. It turns out that giving samples of work is much more effective than giving rubrics. Eliciting evidence. In most classrooms in the US, a teacher needs to decide whether to move on or not and makes a decision by asking a question to the whole class, which is answered by one or two students, usually the confident ones, and the teacher makes a decision about the learning needs of the whole group based on the responses of one or two confident volunteers. So as a key way of getting better evidence for your classroom decisions, let's get evidence from all the students. Feedback it can be very powerful, but students usually don't do very much with it. So one of the key strategies sorry, one of the key techniques, I should say, that we found very effective is this broad idea of making feedback into detective work. And maths, the mathematics teacher can say to the students, not correcting the ones that are wrong, but say, five of these are wrong, you find them, you fix them. An English language arts teacher, Charlotte Kerrigan, wanted to give students feedback in the form of comments, but she wanted the students to read the comments carefully. So rather than writing her comments on the students' work, she wrote her comments on strips of paper and each student, each group of four students got back their four pieces of writing and the four comments and their task as a group of four was to match the comments to the writing. And in both of those examples, what you have here is a very nice example of making feedback into detective work, making students think about what they're doing to take on board the feedback. And a very nice protocol for starting students as learning resources for one another, we call two stars and a wish. So when we ask students to comment on each other's work, we say, use this format, I like that, I like that, I wish you'd done that. And then finally, for students to reflect on their own work, a very simple idea which works everywhere from kindergarten up through to PhD studies. After a task, think about something you found easy about the task, something you found challenging, and something you found interesting. Now, many people will be saying, well, hang on a minute, we're already doing the, all these other things, how can we do this? Well, what I want to suggest is another way of looking at this in terms of the five strategies that shows that they are actually the most cost-effective, powerful things we can be doing. 
So the Educational Endowment Foundation was asked to look at all the research on all the things we could do to improve student achievement. And they were asked to look at the cost of the interventions, the size of the impact on student achievement, and also the quality of the evidence. And so they produced a table, and I've included all three slides here in the slide, slide deck so that people can see them later if they're interested. But I want to just draw attention to the top three. So these, um, these interventions, if you like, are grouped uh, and ranked in terms of their cost effectiveness. And the top three are feedback, metacognition and self-regulated learning, and peer tutoring. So the three most cost effective things we could do to raise student achievement are feedback, metacognition and self-regulation, and peer tutoring. How does that relate to formative assessment? Well, let's look at the, th the strategies. Feedback, self-regulated learning, peer tutoring. So the three most cost-effective interventions we could undertake are three of the five strategies of formative assessment. What about the other two? Well, the important point is you can't give feedback until you find out what's going wrong. So you have to elicit the evidence. So a necessary precondition for effective feedback is to elicit evidence of learning. And you don't know what evidence to elicit. You don't know what questions to ask students until you're clear about the learning goals. So these five strategies seem to form a key set, perhaps a minimal set, of the high impact educational interventions that we could undertake to improve student achievement. Doesn't matter why, why you want to raise student achievement, the evidence is that attention to classroom formative assessment seems to be the most powerful way of doing this. And just one final study here. Um, this is a recent meta-analysis by Kingston and Nash who looked at a number of studies of formative assessment in the US and elsewhere and they found 40 studies and what they found was that the average effect size was about 0.2 which if you know something about effect sizes might not seem that important but most of these studies were conducted by middle school and high school students where one year's learning is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.3 standard deviations. So it turns out that this is actually quite a large effect size. It's equivalent to a 50 to 70% increase in the rate of learning. That's what the research shows. When we do classroom formative assessment, minute by minute and day by day, we seem to accelerate our students' learning by between 50 and 70%. The problem is, to do this effectively, we have to change teachers' classroom practices. And that's what I want to close with. We, over the last 30 years, have been looking at the wrong knowledge. We have regarded improving teaching as a process of knowledge acquisition, not a process of habit change. That would be ineffective because telling teachers what to do doesn't work. It's like trying to tell somebody how to ride a bicycle. Telling somebody how to ride a bicycle doesn't help them ride a bicycle. They have to practice riding a bicycle. And what I want to argue is that expertise in teaching, the kind of knowledge that's needed for expertise in teaching, is much more like the knowledge of riding a bicycle than it is the knowledge of solving quadratic equations. And that's why most professional development have been, has been relatively ineffective. We have been trying to tell teachers what to do. And the key insight here, I think, is about the, res the emerging research base on habit change. In many cases, habit change doesn't require knowledge. It requires finding ways of getting rid of old habits. If people want to give up smoking. They know how harmful it is. To stop people from smoking, it does no good to actually tell them about the risks of smoking. What they need is support in changing habits. And the hardest bit of all is not getting new ideas into people's heads, it's getting the old ones out. It takes time and it doesn't happen naturally. That's very clear from the research. It turns out that the variability of teachers with 20 years experience is just about as great as teachers with one year's experience. So we don't see this, this, this convergence on expertise in teaching that we see in other areas because teachers are not engaged in deliberate practice. So to conclude, what I want to suggest is that 
current policies of pursuing um, ways of getting the best and brightest into teaching is unlikely to succeed because the fact is that smarter people don't make better teachers. They probably wouldn't stay. We need people who really actually care about young people, who really want to push themselves to get better when nobody else is pushing them because they know that when they do their job better as teachers, it improves the lives of the young people that they serve. So if, that's, if teaching expertise is like expertise in other areas, then it turns out that in 10 years' time, with 10 years' worth of deliberate practice, we could actually have practically every single teacher in America being as good as the very best. And that's an extraordinary idea. Most teachers are simply nothing like as good as they could be if we supported them in the right way. So we want to, first of all, get the right people into the job, the people who will push themselves to get better when nobody else has pushed them to get better. The idea of detoxifying professional development. The reason people need professional development is not because they're not very good, it's because you can be even better. And just a final thought. What this means to me is that there's no limit to what American teachers can achieve if we support them in the right way. So that's basically the argument. If you want to read more, you can look at this, the books that I've written with my various colleagues. There's Embedded Formative Assessment, there's Embedding Formative Assessment, which is much more a practical handbook. And for the leader's role, there's a book called Leadership for Teacher Learning, which stresses the role of leaders in this. I now want to um, throw it open for, for questioning. So I want to see if there's any questions that people want to ask. Um, I shall go into the chat window, into the Q&A window. Um, Antonio is pointing out that um, there's going to be a recording available subsequently. Um, so that, I think, answers many of the questions. Um, at the moment, uh, we only have uh, four questions. So um, if you have any questions, we're very happy to hear them. Where, um, Christy Silver is asking, where do most districts start? Well, I think this is very interesting. Uh, there's some nice research on habit change reviewed by two brothers, Chip and Dan Heath, in a book called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard, published in 2010. And they said, start with the bright spots. If you want to change habits, start with making things work. So I would say, if I was in a district, I would say, find 10 or 15 teachers who really want to work on this. If you try to mandate this, there'll always be people who say, this won't work with our students. It's very hard for them to say that if it's working in the classroom next door. So I would say, start with, this, with the bright spots, figure out ways supporting these people, give them time to work on the practice. And we have now quite a lot of evidence that all you need is 75 minutes once a month. So teachers promise their colleagues are going to try some of these techniques out. They try them out, they meet together, hold each other accountable, and simply just getting into that rhythm of once every month meeting together for 75 minutes seems to be a very powerful way of supporting people in making a start on this. The other thing I think that's really important is to get away from this idea that this is an initiative that will actually take a certain amount of time. What I'm suggesting is that because of the nature of the changes in the world of work, change is the new normal. In other words, that all teachers are going to have to carry on getting better, not because they're not good enough, but because it can be even better. So it's about creating that framework within in every school where every single teacher, even if they're already the best teacher in the school, every teacher accepts the need to get even better. Okay, um, that's it as far as I can see. Um, if, there's any, if there's any last questions? No? Okay, so um, as, as Antonio's saying, a recording of the entire webinar, which will capture both the slides and the audio, will be available at some point. Um, as I said, you can read more about these things. There's lots of my stuff available, freely available on YouTube, and lots of stuff on my website, dylanwilliam.net. And my advice, as I said in the answer to Christie's question, just get stuck in there, just get started. That, I think, is the best way. But I come back to this big idea. As far as we know, expertise in teaching is like expertise in other areas. Every 
teacher in America could be as good as the very best if we provide a supporting framework that allows them to focus on this idea of deliberate practice to get even better.